Chapter one of Origins traced the birth and pedigree of Curb Your Enthusiasm, Larry David's comedy series that just completed its ninth season on HBO. Now, with Origins Chapter two, we move from comedy to sports. Not that the two are always mutually exclusive. With each of the five episodes capturing individual elements from the world of ESPN. Over the course of Origins Chapter Two, we will navigate our way through numerous eras of ESPN's 38-year history, from its sub-humble start to the more challenging and sometimes mistake-prone periods of the present day. Here in Episode One, ESPN and Social Media: A Troubled Marriage, we will see the media giant embrace, wrestle, and even detest. A critical and still burgeoning facet of its business. Every company has a one-loss record. Given ESPN's astonishing success over the past three plus decades in programming, marketing, sales, rights acquisitions, cable fees, and more, it's surprising how much trouble ESPN has had dealing with and adapting to social media. On too many occasions, social media has been ESPN's kryptonite, a rather unfortunate relationship. Given how inextricably linked many sports fans now are to their Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Snap accounts, in this episode we'll ask, among other questions, why does ESPN seem to have more problems in this area than its competitors? How do various personalities at ESPN regard social media? And in the end, is it a plus or a negative for the network? As is our practice here at Origins, we start by going back to the beginning, but by way of warm up. Several current or former ESPNers share their initial thoughts on those media we call social. ESPN president John Skipper had a full head of hair before all his dealings with social network. Okay, not really, but still. We found this sort of odd ability by people to somehow think that Twitter was not public, so they would be somewhat surprised when there would be a public furor or a public to do. About something that had been on, we had an incident where somebody tweeted pictures of themselves, and seemed surprised to find out that they were public. Very few ESPN employees get to be mentioned by name from the podium in the White House briefing room. Here's former newspaper writer and Michigan State alum Jamel Hill, who is now co-anchor of the 6 p.m. edition of Sports Center. I think about what social media was like. Sort of when I first joined Twitter, I feel like maybe it was like 2009, 10, somewhere in there. Twitter was totally different. I mean, yeah, it's always going to be a bit of a, a wild, wild west element to it. But I think because a lot of the media wasn't on it yet, a lot of serious organizations weren't on it. It was just you know full of people who were funny and engaging. It was a lot more lighthearted. Michelle Beadle, born in Italy, raised in San Antonio. And now on her way from Sports Nation to the new Mike Greenberg show. You know, I don't want to embarrass the company. I don't want to embarrass myself. And at the same time, I do find it to be an important place to just sort of express yourself. And you know, it's a longer, quicker, broader outreach than say what I get on Sports Nation and what I'm allowed to do on NBA Countdown. It's great and it's bad. I asked, pardon the interruptions, co-host Michael Wilbon, if there ever was a time he wished he could express an opinion, but didn't. Because he was afraid of ESPN's response. <laughs> no, I say what I'm going to say. I've never gotten pushback, and I don't go into any day thinking about what I'm not going to say. I think there are ways to say something that are governed by my sense of journalism and what it is and what it still should be. ESPN's news-breaking machine, Adam Schefter, is closing in on forty thousand tweets. I don't know finance. I don't know politics. I pay attention to it, so I don't feel like. There are a lot of opinions that are valid. Again, I try to pay attention to football, and I'm not saying my opinions matter in football because they don't. But I try to be as informed as I can be in the sport that I cover, in the job that I do, and I recognize sometimes how hard that is to do. And so, why would I weigh in with a political opinion when, when I'm not speaking to the most connected people? And I'm not. No, I guess I could have opinions, and I do. But why do people care about them? The six million followers, man. Bill Simmons. You know, ESPN has never been able to fully decide: do they want to push the envelope or not? And they kind of straddle both fences. And usually, they get into trouble when that's going on. She knew it was going to be a disaster as soon as Twitter took off. They could never explain what the lines were. It would change all the time. You know, my issues with them were always like there was never consistency. Colin Coward began his show, The Herd, at ESPN in 2004 before leaving for FS1 in 2015. You know, my rule has always been: don't tweet 
with a cocktail in your hand in your pajamas. You're too comfortable. There's very little upside to Twitter. There can be catastrophic downsides to Twitter. Uh, it's a little bit of a loaded gun. Be aware of that. When ESPN turned 30, former ESPN prez George Bodenheimer had thousands of employees to choose from to act as host for the celebration. He selected anchor Sage Steele. You know, there's so many times that I wish it just didn't exist personally, professionally, with my teenage kids. I have three teenagers, and it's a major issue in our house. I hate it, <laughs> but I get it, and I use it because it's a smart thing to do. If you're really in any kind of business, most, certainly this one, you just have to <laughs> you have to navigate it, and you have to be smart about it. Hey, Russia, WikiLinks, Deadspin, don't waste your time trying to hack Chris Berman's emails, Twitter, or Facebook accounts. He ain't got none of them. Well, I, I can't tell you, Jim, that I saw the complete future coming, but this is a direct quote, and I told it to John Walsh when he wanted me to be one of the first contributors when ESPN.com was fledgling, you know. And I looked at that, and I looked at email and everything, and I understand that the world and, and businesses need to operate on that. I'm not stupid, but my quote was, no good can come of this. Now, I sound like Neanderthal man, but I'm proud of it. There's a little bit of James Dean in me, too, you know. I said, I'm not doing it. I'm not interested in doing it, and I won't ever do it. To this day, I don't do email. Now, that, when you can convince me that 51% of my life is um, compromised because I'm not doing it, then I'll do it. But right now, it's way below 25% that's compromised by not doing it. Plus, it's, it's one of the few ways, personally, for me to keep my relative privacy, you know? At the end of 2008, Facebook had less than 100 million members. Three years later, there were 800 million. And Twitter? It had 1.3 million registered users in 2008. By September 2011, that number exploded to more than 200 million active users. Note to ESPN file, adapt or die. I always thought my Twitter feed was better like the first couple months that I was on Twitter. Bill Simmons. There were way less people on there and you were way less worried about what the repercussions would be for things that you said. I really liked the idea of just kind of shooting from the hip with stuff that wasn't good enough for a column or stuff that was in the moment or reacting to a game that had just happened that I wouldn't care about the next day and things like that. In 2008, when they really started cracking down again and politics was becoming more and more important for them with people just steering clear of that completely and, and then some of the content stuff, the lines were starting to change. And, um, definitely battled with them on that. And then they would take stuff out of my column Left and right, and then I remember at like the 2007 ESPYs or whatever, Lance Armstrong made that joke about Jake Gyllenhaal. It was like a gay sex joke. It was in the monologue, and I was like, I just couldn't believe it. That was probably the maddest. It was like top five maddest I've been at them. More like, than not getting the Obama interview? That was number one maddest. This was in the top five, but it was like, you guys are hypocrites. You never would have let me written that. You would have gotten furious if I wrote that, and now it's like, oh, it's the ESPYs. It's a monologue. This should stay. I was trying to make my column like a column that wasn't a traditional newspaper column. You had to take some chances, and they were afraid to take those chances, and they took stuff out, and they didn't want to have gambling, and, you know, some of the jokes I wrote, they would just take out, and I fought with them a lot. But do you think, though, that being perceived as kind of a Pex bad boy on social media and some of the scrapes that you got into with ESPN, one could say it enhanced your brand? How was I a bad boy? I never did one thing. All I did was behave... You know, think of all the stories that you had in your book. I was there for 15 years. I never had a DUI. I never got accused of grabbing somebody's ass. I mean, nothing ever happened to me other than right. I just busted my ass for them. So, I mean, that's why I said Peck's bad boy, because it's tongue-in-cheek. But No, no, I know what you mean, but I, I did get that feeling like I was some sort of, like, iconoclast there. It's like, how am I an iconoclast? I just, they hired me to give opinions, and I give my opinions, and I try to put thought into them. The 2008 piece that I wrote about, the ombudsman Leanne Schreiber when she wrote about this new content guidebook they were all proud of all these different do's and don'ts and I was just like look if this is going to help me be able to do my job better that's great I wasn't very optimistic and I think it's really hard to come up with a guidebook Schreiber had written quote even longtime pros of the soundest judgment would be challenged by the compartmentalization of qualities ESPN asks of its on-air and online talent be objective in the booth, subjective outside it, stick to the facts as a reporter on ESPN.com, but speculate beyond the facts when we ask for your analysis on TV. Be edgy in your page two columns, but don't cross any lines. Where are the lines? 
We'll tell you when you've crossed one. End quote. By the way, a year later, Simmons would receive a two-week Twitter suspension after calling hosts at ESPN's Boston radio station WEEI, quote, deceitful scumbags, end quote. He was, however, allowed to tweet about his ongoing book tour. Jason Whitlock had two stints at ESPN, the first from 2002 to 2006. He then returned in 2013 for an additional two years before joining FS1. When you were at ESPN, social media was really starting to become a force and a coming of age. Do you think ESPN was ready for social media? I don't think any media company is ready for social media. I think that any journalistic institution wasn't ready for social media. And, and so it's not just ESPN. I don't think the newspaper industry across the country. I don't take Twitter seriously. I, I don't think that Twitter is a place for serious conversation or serious communication. And so my philosophy, I've been pumping out a slogan, judge my columns, enjoy my tweets. And that is my own personal view on how everyone should view Twitter. Twitter is just people's stream of consciousness. It's what we think. It's not what we believe. Judge me off of what I write in a column. Judge me off of what I do on television. But Twitter is a joke. In 2008, ESPN hired Ben Shields as director of social media and marketing. Having studied sports and technology as a graduate student at Northwestern, Shields can be regarded as executive zero in the company's efforts to figure out how to grapple with this new and uncertain playground. Shields left in 2014 and is now a senior lecturer at MIT's Sloan School of Management, where he teaches social media management. I think 2008-2009, we, brand standpoint, were up against some interesting challenges where some fans in our research had indicated that ESPN was getting a little too big, a little too corporate, and had lost its sort of world's biggest sports fan personality. So in programming Facebook and Twitter at the time, one of our overall brand objectives is to speak like a fan, speak with fans, so that some of the prevailing perceptions we could maybe try to reverse. I think the second piece as it relates to talent is I and and a number of my other colleagues were big proponents of this very simple and seemingly obvious point that people connect with other people in social media. It's all well and good for the four letters of ESPN or Sports Center to show up in someone's social feed. But the magic happens when you follow one of our talent and that talent is in your feed. I remember helping out Stuart Scott get on Twitter And that was a very special experience because he saw it as an opportunity to connect more deeply with his fans. ESPN host Michelle Beadle. I laughed so hard, though, because when this whole stupid Twitter first came out, I remember Colin Cowherd and I refusing to do it. And a couple of the PAs at work set up our Twitter accounts for us and, you know, tweeted these innocuously ridiculous things at the very beginning. And we finally went, no, no, we'll just control our own. Here's Sage Steele. From day one, ESPN encouraged us to get on Twitter. And I was like, who the heck cares what I think about this or that or how my day was? Like, what is this? And then you buy in and you say, okay, here are the benefits. I still think we all should, in the back of our minds, just keep in mind that we're not all that. And we have some great jobs and some wonderful platforms, but everybody doesn't need to know every single thing that we're thinking. I was totally uh, naive about it, didn't know anything about it before I started. When Dick Vitale was fired as coach of the Detroit Pistons just 12 games into the 1979-1980 season, ESPN production great Scotty Connell asked him to join the network on air and be part of their basketball coverage. Vitale wanted to concentrate on finding his next coaching job, but his wife implored him to give TV a shot. He said he'd temporarily come on board until he found his next coaching gig. And in December of 1979, just three months after ESPN premiered, Vitale's face popped on the screen. 38 years later, he's still with ESPN. My daughters, they both went to Notre Dame to get the masters here, and they said, Dad, 
that, you could reach so many people, especially for your fundraising efforts, because, you know, I, uh, I'm really uh, dedicated myself now in the latter years of my life to raising money for kids battling cancer. And through social media, I have been able to reach so many people and raise a lot of dollars. It has helped me immensely. So that's really one of the reasons I got involved with the V Foundation uh, for Pediatric Cancer. Jay Billis was a key member of the Duke University college basketball team, which made it to the finals of the 1986 men's tourney and joined ESPN as an analyst in 1995. My wife was the one that talked me into getting involved with social media. She felt like it was the way that younger people communicated in today's world. And she also felt like way too many people thought that I was probably sitting in a basement diagramming plays or that all I cared about was sort of the X's and O's of basketball. And she felt that I needed to show that I had a personality outside of the game and interests outside of the game and, and I could have some fun with it. But I still don't know, honestly, Jim, that I use social media to its fullest. The way I do things on Twitter has less to do with what my bosses will approve of or, or all that. I mean, I'm, I'm always cognizant of that, but it's not what drives me on Twitter. I, don't, I stay away from things that don't have to do with basketball. You know, I certainly have opinions on social issues and politics, but I think they're better kept to myself. You saw the promotional potential of it with tweeting out links to columns. and I had my book come out in October of 2009. I'd been on Twitter for six months, and it really helped get awareness for, hey, Amazon has it for 50% off now, or, hey, my book tour is going to these spots, things like that. And it really helped with 30 for 30 because ESPN didn't promote 30 for 30. So we basically had me, and it was really helpful to tweet out the times and the re-airs. When 30 for 30 came, you know, people would jump in halfway through, and they would be like, what is this? And it was really helpful to go on Twitter and say, hey, we're re-running this on ESPN2 at midnight. Linda Cohn was an early adapter who joined Twitter in January 2009, one of the first Sports Center anchors to do so. I was on social media, I think, even before Sports Center had a Twitter handle. I felt people needed to know who I was and that I wasn't a talking head. And also, I never put ESPN on my Twitter handle ever because I am never defined by ESPN or those four letters. That was just a stage, a vehicle for me. That was another thing that was really significant to me, that my words, my opinions were always my own. Scott Van Pelt is one of ESPN's more recognizable anchors and an important caretaker of the Sports Center brand. I'm not good at it. I'm not good at doing the promotion, using it as a vehicle to say, hey, watch us here and promote who's on. And as far as a bullhorn, you know, like the Blues Brothers driving around, you know, announcing the show that night, I just don't want to use it that way. So I just... I try not to do it too much, and as far as what it is, to use it as your barometer and to use it as your governor and to use it as your GPS of where to go can be a big mistake, too, because if the only people you follow are like-minded people, then you're convinced that that's the only opinion that exists in the world when clearly it doesn't. And now more than ever before, it's very evident that there are very different schools of thought that are you know diametrically opposed, and so you... You need to listen to everybody, I think, and be cognizant of how people feel and to try to please everybody would be an impossibility. So the best thing I think you can do as far as is social media is, you know, try to follow people that you think are newsmakers and breakers. During the 2008 NBA playoffs, Jamel Hill was suspended after writing an article referencing Adolf Hitler in regard to the Boston Celtics and the Detroit Pistons. Had I tweeted that? Yeah, I would have gotten fired probably, <laughs> you know, because I can't imagine the level. It's not like a rock disappearing into a pond when, or when I wrote that. It created its own firestorm for sure. But thinking about where we are now and how we consume social media and just how big social media has become, that would have been bad for my career. I think that probably would have cost me my job now. You know, I was in newspapers for 10 years before I got to ESPN. And they operated under the same kind of, you know, policies and, and beliefs. So from a, a pure structural and philosophy standpoint, it wasn't different at all. It's just that ESPN is just so much bigger than any place I'd ever worked. Let's say I was at, still at the Sentinel and, you know, God forbid I was hit by a bus. I don't know if the leading thing it said would be Orlando Sentinel columnist hit by bus, where the ESPN, that's like the beginning and end of the sentence, like ESPN. And so it becomes, 
entrenched in your identity, whether you want it to be or not. But you knew what you signed up for when you got there. I mean, that's just kind of one of the compromises you have to make when you're at a place that's as broad and as big as as ESPN is, is that, you know, your personal identity and your ESPN identity become the same from a public perception standpoint. When do you think the tone of Twitter changed and it became more combative or divisive? I think it just happened gradually. You know, just it was death by a thousand paper cuts. And it was certain events that triggered it. Obviously, in the last, you know, few years, things have become really charged given the political climate. And yeah, it just kind of became this place where it wasn't as fun anymore. And you also saw mixed in with that, there were starting to become repercussions for what you said on Twitter. And it could be a costly experience. And that kind of added weirdly to the edginess of it, too. If there was an Exhibit A in ESPN's first serious, unforeseen and viral foray with social media, it may have been the one involving Bruce Feldman. In 2011, ESPN benched and ultimately fired Feldman over the book he wrote with former Texas Tech football coach Mike Leach. Twitter erupted with a free Bruce hashtag. Everything kind of blew up for me. It was in 2011. So for my context, so I'd been at ESPN about 17 years at that point, And it was the Wednesday of the ESPYs. And on, on the way in there, I got a call from a couple of my bosses at ESPN Magazine, and they were talking about the book that I had just co-authored with Mike Leach, the former Texas Tech football coach who had really got sideways with a lot of people at Texas Tech, got fired because of allegations that he had mistreated one of his players, and that player's dad was Craig James, who was a ESPN announcer, and it just was a big mess. I mean, that's a long story in itself. So Chad Millman, who had been running ESPN Magazine, and he was out for the ESPYs, and we were talking about what was going on with the book that had come out. It was showing ESPN in a negative light, and there was a bunch of other things that they were doing, including, hey, I heard you're supposed to be going to the ESPYs tonight. You shouldn't go. You know, And then it was like a bunch of restrictions on me. And then on Thursday morning, I had a conference call with a bunch of ESPN executives, and it went really bad. It just was like I was kind of incredulous because I had always I felt like I had a really good reputation there. And so it was just kind of surreal to be in the middle of that. Well, then, you know, I'm trying to get a hold of my wife and talk about what's gone on. And, you know, at that point, you're just kind of your head is spinning. Like I said, I was like the first time I'd ever thought about, am I going to still be at ESPN? And I got a call from somebody and he goes, hey, man, just thinking about you, I heard what happened. And I was like, kind of puzzled. Like, How does this person know what happened? And then he said, well, it's on the Internet and it's all over Twitter. And I flipped open my laptop and I looked, you know, then all of a sudden my phone started ringing. And um, it was the weirdest night of my life, you know, because it's literally, and I've used this analogy before, but it's like looking down at your own funeral, like because you're seeing all these people talking about you and you're just kind of confused. I was like, because my wife happened to be in Chicago at the time, she looked online and she goes, what the hell is going on? I saw Jason Whitlock's changed his Twitter avatar to you. And mind you, at this point, I don't even know Jason Whitlock. Do you remember the first time you saw the hashtag Free Bruce? I don't know how long it had been up at that point, you know, in my own, like, stupidity. Here I am thinking as this is blowing up, this is just for context. Within, I don't know, probably like the previous six months or so, there was all the Ohio State stuff with Jim Trestle getting forced out. And I just remember thinking, I wonder if Ohio State fans are going to rip me because, you know, now I'm getting my own comeuppance or something. And you just think, you know, people are going to celebrate you being squeezed by your boss or whatever. And it was actually the opposite. By 2011, management and staffers were at odds about what the parameters for social media use were. You know, they didn't have the right people. They just didn't get it. And I think that part of why something like that happens is because you have older people. You know, you have people who are middle-aged for the most part. They're in Connecticut. And they're always going to be behind on anything. You just kind of miss it. Here's John Skipper. We first released the guidelines in 11. And we were recently trying to remind ourselves why we did so. And it was completely a different environment than now. We were mostly concerned about people breaking news on Twitter, and we were concerned about people commenting about their colleagues on Twitter. 
Twitter at that point did not have the kind of toxic environment, the sort of proportional trolling that it has now. So those were not really the issues. And of course, we probably were a little slow to rethink about them in as of the overall sort of environment of the country has become more polarized and we just were slow to respond to that. Here's Colin Coward. In terms of uh, social media guidelines, when you were at ESPN, did you have a clear understanding of the boundaries that you were operating within in terms of what the company wanted from you? Uh, I don't think anybody did. I remember there was a meeting one time and Rob King was so honest. He's like, listen, this thing's moving really fast. Uh, and it was a really funny moment. Rob just kind of said, I may change all this in an hour. I think that's a really difficult position for management, to be honest. I think that's a very difficult position for all management. I, I'm not sure if it was the New York Times, but maybe it was the New York Times a month ago said, don't put anything in Twitter you wouldn't put in the newspaper. Is that the way to do it? I don't know. I am so glad I'm not in management because it is very easy to look at managers and point fingers and say, oh, come on, these guys, how could you not see that? Literally, social media, Jim, has toppled governments. This is fluid. It's hot. It is ever-changing. I'm glad I'm not in management. We had an all-hands meeting. I can't remember when. It was 2012, 13, pretty shortly into my tenure as president, where we called everybody in and said, Look, part of the rules of engagement are this is a public forum. If you tweet something out, it's pretty close to your being on television and giving an interview. And second, and it actually wasn't about tweeting. We actually had somebody who did something inappropriate put pictures of himself on a uh, cell phone. And when he was disciplined for that, he said, that's none of your business. That's me, and it's I'm personal. We established the principle that you are ESPN's so-and-so. And And as your employer, we have a right to uh, ask for or even demand certain kinds of behavior. And it's okay if it's legal behavior and it's your right to do. You may do it, but you just may not be working here if you do it. And I think that's a pretty established principle of the American workplace. And uh, uh, we did that, and that lasted a long time. In February of 2012, an ESPN editor was fired and another suspended for a headline on ESPN.com's mobile website that referred to NBA player Jeremy Lin as a, quote, chink in the armor, end quote. Here's Ben Shields on ESPN's response. It happened in the middle of the night. Uh, It was, you know, I think 2 or 3 a.m. And I think it was on a Friday night, too. And woke up the next morning, Saturday, I was on my way to go for a little run, and the email started flooding in. The feedback was instantaneous, and it was voluminous on social media, and so that we had to deal with it as a company. We had to figure out what our response was going to be. And I think in the end, we learned that when crises happen, because it's not a question of if, it's a question of when, When crises happen in social media, we have to have an organizational game plan in place where we know who the small team is going to be to deal with the crisis, what executives need to be involved to make decisions, and then ultimately how we're going to track our approach throughout the lifetime of the crisis. Who should be the spokesperson for a particular crisis? In other words, who is the message coming from? Is it coming from the main four letters of ESPN on Twitter, so the ESPN Twitter account? Or is it coming from the ESPN PR account? And in the Lynn crisis, the ESPN main account communicated a message of apology. And we learned, at least when I was at the company, that it was often best for the official apologies or crisis situation statements to come from the ESPN PR account. In March 2013, after Seattle Seahawks star Richard Sherman and First Take co-host Skip Bayless got into an intense shouting match, Simmons went to Twitter and called the segment, quote, awful and embarrassing, adding, nobody won, everybody lost, including ESPN, end quote. 
he quickly became the recipient of another two-week Twitter suspension. When I was tweeting about first take that time, it never occurred to me I was going to get in trouble for that because, if anything, I thought my first tweet made it seem like I was defending the show, which I didn't want to do. That's why like eight minutes passed before I did the next two tweets, and they were basically to clarify the meaning of the first tweet. And it came from a genuine place, you know. They called me, I think it was Rob Kang, and explained it to me. It was just like, we feel the stature you have at the company, both internally because of all the people that work for you, and then externally with the position you're in. You're hosting Countdown, and you're running Grantland, and you're EP of 30 for 30. And you have a podcast. Like You're too visible to criticize one of our shows. And they basically admitted, we're treating this differently than if it had been just somebody else because you can't do this. I had a pretty big platform on Twitter, too. I think it was me and Schefter were the only ones that really had gigantic Twitter followings those first couple years. And mine took a couple months to grow, and then all of a sudden it kind of just started mushrooming. I mean, you went from like 2 million to 3 million in a nanosecond. I remember that. Well, yeah, I remember when I got suspended. I never knew how many people were genuine or not with actual numbers, like who was a robot. And if you're in the news, does that do some robots trigger and all of a sudden you have these fake followers? But anytime anything major happened with me and ESPN, it definitely bumped the Twitter followers. ESPN host, Michelle Beadle. The great Bill Simmons once told me, why are you engaging? And at the time, I sort of dismissed it with a laugh, as I've done with a lot of things with Bill, and just said, you know, it's fun. And why not? It's, it's fans, it's non-fans, it's a conversation. He just said, why engage? And it was odd to me because I realized that he, he is very notorious for, and there are a couple guys that do this, where they just sort of, they tweet, they tweet a lot, but they never engage. And I guess two years ago or up until I was engaging a lot, I found pleasure in sort of roasting trolls. And there is, I, look, I get it. it. There's something fun about just testing your sarcasm tools and well, throwing were, them out there. You were pretty good at it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you just throw them to the wolves and then the wolves have at it. And then I realized, Eh, what, what comes of that? You're not getting paid to tweet. You're not getting paid to engage. I'm torn on this because there are days where I absolutely hate social media. And then there are other days where I think there's a lot of good in it and a lot of value. And then some days where you just want to turn it all off. <laughs> and so I just try to remember, you know, I do have a job and I do have a mortgage and I don't want to get fired. But at the same time, I, I also want to be myself and not feel like I've just been sort of painted into a corner. Do you check mentions? Do you Google yourself? <laughs> oh, God, no. I, um, I stopped Googling myself probably, God, it's been at least five years. And I told my parents not to Google me, but I can't really verify whether or not they've taken that warning. Um, but I found somewhere along the lines, I want to say during the first round of I Should Kill Myself tweets that I got from Florida State fans a few years ago, I realized it wasn't worth it, and it was truly affecting my mental being. Life's too short, life's too happy, and at the end of the day, what somebody thinks about me doesn't change anything about my actual life, so why let it get in? Well, that's certainly a healthy attitude. It took a long time, though, to get there, (laughs) to be honest. It was not easy. I'm sitting here with Bob, my producer, and Chris, the Cadence 13 bigwig here. And uh, you guys have parachute stuff? Oh, I have it. It's amazing. What do you, you have the sheets, the towels, and all that stuff? Oh, I got the Venice sheets and the towels. It's the, sent to you. He knows the bottle names. names and everything. Holy he's, cow. He's gone deep. So here's the thing. Did you guys see this thing on YouTube? There was an admiral. His name was uh, McRaven. He yes. was giving this speech, and it went viral because he said that the most important thing to do every day is you wake up and you make your bed. And then I had heard that Michelle Obama, when the Obamas moved into the White House, one of the first things she said to her daughters is, look, you may be living in the White House, but you're still going to be making your bed. (laughs) And so I thought about that because when I got the parachute comforter, I was running out one day and I do make my bed every morning, but I kind of like just pulled it up, straightened it out and just ran. And then I looked back and like, it looked like I had spent 10 minutes making the bed. Have you encountered that? I don't make my bed as often as I should, uh-huh. but it looks good when I do. I think Bob made his bed about a year ago, but would probably work out really well. I'm t- If this is a, uh, a self-making bed, I'm all for it. It actually doesn't <laughs> roll back by itself like a <laughs> pool cover. But um, what's the deal with the towels? Because I haven't tried the towels yet. They're just so soft. They just feel yeah. great on like when you come out of the shower. Wait a minute. Were those the ones when we went camping that you brought? Yeah. 
Yeah. Actually, he brought those things camping, and those things were amazing. We all went camping one time, and he brought those, and they were unbelievable. Okay, I just think that they look too nice to be on camping. But well, maybe... I, yeah, but it was nice. I mean, I, we had well, something to use. Look at, look at Bob bringing parachute towels. Um, <laughs> well, listen, here's the good news. They're so sure that you'll love their sheets that they offer basically a 60-night trial. So if you don't love them, you just send them back. No questions asked after 60 nights. And they even donate bedding for Habitat for Humanity, which... Oh, that's cool. You know, that's very sounds cool. Sounds like a pretty cool idea. Wow. So visit parachutehome.com slash origins now for free shipping and returns on Parachute's amazing bedding. I got to go to this thing because I'm telling you, my sheets are subpar and these things sound amazing. All right. So don't forget, parachutehome.com slash origins. Origins is made possible by you. Who are you? We know that you downloaded the podcast, but we really don't know anything about you. The folks who support this show would love to know just a little bit about who is listening. If you have two minutes, it really does only take two minutes, help us make the show an even better experience for you by telling us more about yourself. Just go to Listener Q, L I S T E N E R Q dot com forward slash origins and take the short survey. You can also give us direct feedback about the show, which we would love to hear. And as a thank you, you'll be entered into a drawing for a $100 Amazon gift certificate. Two minutes. That's it. ListenerQ.com slash origins. That's ListenerQ.com slash origins. On September 11th, 2017, at 6.54 p.m., with protests in Charlottesville, Virginia, on her mind, Jamel Hill tweeted, quote, Donald Trump is a white supremacist who has largely surrounded himself with other white supremacists, end quote. Minutes later, she called him a bigot. The president of the United States demanded an apology. Indeed, the White House pushed for Hill to be fired. ESPN issued a statement saying Hill had apologized, which was true, sort of. Hill clung to her claim that the president was indeed a white supremacist. There was no punishment. For people who thought just because you didn't get suspended over the Trump tweets that that was a walk in the park for you afterwards, just because you weren't suspended doesn't mean that it was those were easy days for you. The meeting that I had with Skipper was very emotional. Um, he and I have always had a good relationship. He's been a big supporter, not just myself, but also Mike. And that was new terrain for us. And I'd never obviously had been called in his office under those particular circumstances. 90% of the time, our meetings have been very jovial and cordial and, and fun and more about plotting out, you know, my career and the success of whatever I was doing there. So it was just foreign territory for both of us. And I think because of that, it was a super emotional meeting. Anybody who knows me knows I'm not a crier at all. That is not me. I tend to get the opposite description of being a little too stoic. And for me to cry in a meeting, it wasn't because he said something that was mean to me or that he disparaged me in any way. It's just like when you sit down with somebody that you feel like you kind of let down in a way that maybe you hadn't intended. It was just emotional for me. So I let him know that. Obviously, it was tough because of, you know, my staff was uh, very concerned. The production staff was very concerned. Mike was concerned. It was just a tough couple of days. The issue of race came up quite early on, and people were kind of directing a lot of it towards ESPN and ESPN management for the life of me. And I'm not a skipper apologist because I can criticize him, you know, when I feel it's necessary, and I have. But this guy has been committed to diversity, has put the undefeated on his watch. And by the way, I don't think it's much of a money-making enterprise, but he still supports it all the time. It seemed to me that he got no margin of error from the community, given all that he's done. Does that make sense to you? I mean, did you think about that at all? Yeah, I did. And that was part of the reason why that meeting with him was so emotional, because ESPN was being branded as racist and Skipper was being branded as a racist. People who obviously don't work there don't have the benefit of knowing who he is, only see someone who is, to them, just a symbol of ESPN and corporate America and a white dude. And a lot of people looked at this as just another example of a black woman with a voice being silenced and suppressed. And that certainly was not fair to him. And it wasn't fair to ESPN. And that's what I mean about kind of the collateral damage 
Look, Skip and I may not always a thousand percent agree on everything. I mean, it's just like you would with anybody that you work for and work with. But he has a good heart and he's a good person. And I've always enjoyed being around him. And for people who don't know him, they see him entirely differently because he became the symbol of other things that people are frustrated by in this country. The African-American community not only rushed to Hill's defense, but strongly criticized ESPN. Here's John Skipper. How did that make you feel that that community, which you've been so supportive of, seemed to, I'm going to say, turn its back on you? We, as an organization, have been committed to hiring people of color and to supporting women. And uh, we don't have any intention of pulling up from that support. And I'm pretty aware that advocacy organizations do a lot of good in trying to monitor sort of how people are performing relative to what they are most interested in advocating. But they also have some large element of fundraising and self-preservation. They very seldom say, gee, we're upset about this behavior, but would like to note that the organization has long been a good advocate of the behavior we'd like to see. It's just, you know, they're highly attuned towards an opportunity to uh, seize the public spotlight, raise some money. So I didn't regard anything like a community turning its back on ESPN. Here's Jason Whitlock. You know, stand with Jamel was a Twitter hashtag. There was no stand with John Skipper. He's had our back because I do think you could make a very persuasive case that he has been very supportive of black journalists. You know, I may disagree with some of the journalists or people he's labeled journalists and supported, but his sincere commitment to black media, I I think you could put a very persuasive case that, you know, perhaps no one in the media has done more, but because there was some traction to be gained from supporting Jamel, people turned on John Skipper. Uh, And that's a Twitter thing. And again, all of the media is being led around by the shallowest form of communication that has ever been created on this planet. And it's a shame. And that's how good people get their reputation smeared constantly without any second thought or any regard for what that person has stood for, what they've done. Two weeks later, in response to a statement issued by Dallas Cowboys owner Jerry Jones declaring he would bench any players who knelt during a performance of the national anthem, Hill tweeted, quote, change happens when advertisers are impacted. If you feel strongly about JJ's statement, boycott his advertisers, end quote. This time, ESPN suspended Hill for two weeks. Well, the tweets that I had about Jerry Jones and the NFL and the anthem protest, If I make that point on television, I don't think it creates a firestorm at all because people can pick up on the nuance of what I was trying to say. And it's something I've actually said on television before and nobody wrote about it and not specifically related to Jerry Jones, but just in general, when it came to, you know, the NFL and the anthem protest and even when it came to domestic violence and even when it came to concussions. The thing about Twitter is that tweets give certain outlets cheap, easy headlines, you know, really good clickbait. And they don't really care about the nuance of what you're trying to say. Nuance basically isn't allowed on Twitter. You know, you try to sort of force it and make your point, but it's just kind of the way that it is. So, yeah, I mean, it's kind of crazy that there would be such a wide gap between what people and how they consume it when they read a tweet versus what they see on TV. But, you know, nevertheless, that's kind of the the social bubble that we're in. You used the word intent. I mean, I don't believe you wrote that tweet intending to get suspended or intending to create a firestorm. Could you talk a little bit more about the word intent and intentions versus results? I never intended for it to create the firestorm that it did. I thought I was tweeting something pretty benign and it was something I planned to say on television that day or the next evening because I think this all kind of broke on a Sunday, on an NFL Sunday, uh, when Jerry Jones was asked about his opinions on the anthem protest. And I think because the controversy and the spectacle of my tweets about uh, Donald Trump hadn't quite worn off 
you know, my mistake was not understanding that that was going to bring about an entirely different and new level of scrutiny, as naive as that sounds, is, yeah, I'm used to getting scrutinized. I mean, it's part of the job and part of the position. But, you know, once those Trump tweets kind of got out there, that brought sort of a whole new audience that was kind of paying attention to things I was saying. And (laughs) I was just as surprised as anyone. I did apologize to Skipper. I apologize to my colleagues on our show, to Michael, you know, and not about the content of what I said, because that I was frankly never going to apologize for. So it wasn't because of the content of what I said. It was just the position it, it unfortunately put everybody in. And ESPN is it's been the best job that I've ever had. I was struck by the fact that I had several people calling me after Believe it or not, not after the second Jamel incident, which she got suspended for, but after the first about Trump. And they talked about they had never seen you so upset. You know, what is it like for you to have to go through some of these things? I mean, I know you're a big boy and they pay you a lot of money for this, but could you just talk about the personal side of it for a second? I um, generally have had the ability to remain calm. And I must confess that there's been... A significant amount of stress and dealing with situations where it's very difficult to parse what the right thing to do is in a very complicated environment is frustrating. And I have let that get the better of me a few times. I'm trying not to anymore because I'm trying to keep the greater picture in mind. And of course, I have a great deal of affection for this company and for the people who work here. And in some instances, I I feel a bit like I've let them down. And so I think that probably is um, the result of that. And my intention going forward is to try to stick to who we are as a company, what our values are, and to try to stick to who we are as an organization and, and rely upon remembering as a journalistic organization. And it clearly is an environment that is harder to navigate than it has been uh, in the past. Isn't part of the anger or whatever disappointment or feeling like after all the policies and after all the discussions and after all the awareness of something, aren't you allowed to be frustrated by the fact that, Jesus Christ, we're, here we are again? There's certainly one of the things that, where it's hard to control your emotions is where things feel out of your control, right? Where you feel like you try to make the right decisions, you try to set the right policies in place, and you can only control so much. And I do think sometimes people forget how big ESPN is and how much content we produce and how many people we have. And at this point, the level of scrutiny we have, which doesn't really leave much margin for error. So I think there was sort of a perfect storm of frustration for about a four or five, six week period where we had several things happen that were frustrating. And I think I've probably, those things piled up on each other. And uh, I hope I've learned a good lesson in how to try to remain calm in the face of difficult things. But everybody's human and, and sometimes it gets the better of you. And if I've shown some of that in the workplace, uh, I regret it. And I'm, I'm trying to, to avoid that. Though I do believe sometimes people like to see a little passion. Again, it's all complicated. I think a larger examination of the facts would reveal that we are overwhelmingly on the right side here and an organization doing significantly more to hire people of color and women and put them in positions of authority and in influence on the air and and to give them shows and we spend a lot of time worrying about equal pay for equal work for women so i think we're on the right side of most of these things so i'm not going to get particularly disheartened by um, a few vocal critics have you noticed that the way in which the network decides to respond to social media issues in terms of whether to punish or not winds up being sometimes a de facto branding of its belief system, so to speak, because, you know, I think that people are quick to point out that Simmons was suspended for saying something bad about Roger Goodell, NFL commissioner, but Jamel wasn't for saying something about President Trump. And even though there might be elements within each of those cases, which speak differently to why, you know, the response was what it was. It seems that in this day and age now, there's a tendency to kind of attach it to orthodoxies, particularly when ESPN is concerned. 
There is, and look, the, many of those kinds of protests are not much attuned to nuance, right? Because uh, part of the appropriate desire there is to create branding for its own self and for its own standing relative to the advocacy of something, simple matters, which can be somewhat portrayed simply, are better at doing that than nuanced matters. So I I sort of understand the nature of it, and I'm not not that cynical about it. The co-host of PTI, Mike Wilbon. John Skipper is a wonderful boss, and I have gotten to know John. And there have been I hate to use the word underlings, but okay, a, a lieutenants, whatever you want to use, that I've gotten to know a little bit, but I don't pay attention to Bristol. You know, I wasn't, I'm not one of those people who got involved in the politics of the place. Couldn't tell you who's head of what thing, like individual, they, you got this person oversees this many shows. I have no freaking idea, nor do I care. I certainly can't criticize any policy coming out of Bristol because I say what I want to say, and anybody can check the tape, as they say, to see what I've said or see what I've written which is obviously lasting. Maybe it didn't have as many people put eyeballs on it as Jamel's Twitter account. I'm not sure how many Twitter followers she has. I have five million, so it's not a small audience. And I'm gonna say what I'm gonna say. But is it hard for you sometimes to see colleagues that don't have that kind of freedom on social media that when they do voice their opinion, then they get reprimanded or worse? I don't know what the standard is. I don't know what the rules are. Like, I don't know. When Jamel was suspended, what was it for? For saying it? For saying it on social media? I don't know what the rules are. I don't spend a lot of time reviewing them. Because, again, I, my rules I use to govern me, I think, are a lot, I'm not going to say stricter. I think they're a lot more in line with what journalism is and ought to be and has been, good journalism, than some of the things I hear are rules. But I tweeted out that I would stand by and support Jamel that day more than any other day, anywhere, anytime. I texted that out. I think it was about 24 hours later because I've been traveling the first day. I really wasn't aware of what was going on the first day as much. When I get off a plane, I want to be more familiar before I got on social media. Which, by the way, there's an anti-social media trend right there, being more aware. (laughs) But I criticized Trump on this show, between the commas, and will continue to. What do you think the difference is between what she does and what you do? I have no idea. I don't know what the rules are for that show. You mentioned geography, Bristol versus being here. I'm closer to, what are we, five blocks from the White House right now? I don't care what they think. You know, somebody hired us to give our opinions on this show. There's not going to be a silence from me on this show or anywhere else. I mean, you couldn't do this job if you... I wouldn't. Dan Rather, on a Facebook post recently, wrote, I've seen silence in the face of bigotry, and it's ugly. It is. It's lazy. It's not good journalism. It's lazy. It's gutless. It's afraid. I'm none of those things. I might might not have gotten a story on a beat... Or I might have missed a take, as they like to say now, but silence in the face of something that everybody knows what the deal is, that's gutless. I hate gutlessness more than anything else. ESPN college football guru, Paul Feinbaum. In late August, early September of 2016, when the Kaepernick story was just breaking, and I was on a program with Marcus Spears, And we were speaking very honestly about it. And I made somewhat of a flipping comment that I really don't understand where or why Colin Kaepernick feels so strongly about this. I actually uttered the statement along the lines of that black people are not oppressed in this country. And I will say that it's not exactly what I meant, but that's what I said. And the next day it was picked up by the blogosphere from Deadspin to the Huffington Post to you name it. And I mean, I was painted uh, in the worst possible way. And that was fairly difficult because you know who you are, you know what you meant, but there's also very little you can do to respond. So interestingly, after three days of just some of the most vile reaction that I've ever seen in my life, it was, it's not like you could even keep up with it. It was like watching the Dow Jones ticker. It was moving so fast. I mean, usually if you get reaction to something, it's good. If you get a lot of reaction, it's great. This was DEFCON 1. And I was very bothered by it because that's, uh, that's not who I am. It's not the way I was brought up. So finally, uh, I had flown to Knoxville for the very first Thursday night game of the year after I landed. 
uh, sports center asked if I would be on right after I got in, and, and they said, no, Carrie Champion wants to ask you about this. And yeah, it was a moment that I don't know why I reacted so quickly, but I said, yes, that's fine. And I thought of for a couple of seconds, what would I say? And I wasn't sure what I was going to say, but I knew it would be one of the most important things I was confronted with at ESPN. And when she asked me about it, I said, I was wrong. I blew it. My comments were inarticulate. It's not what I really feel. It's not what I really meant. And I apologized. And it was uh, it was really one of the most interesting moments of my career. A lot of people at that point felt like I had completely sold out, that I had caved in under pressure. Although I will say no one at the company, no one instructed me to do it. I did it entirely on my own. In fact, afterwards, some of the people in PR had told me that they, they used it as a textbook to deal with a controversial issue. But I learned from that. You know, I'm, not, I'm not saying I shy away from controversial subjects, but it definitely had a chilling effect on me. I, I don't know if I would compare where I, where I was to where she was, because mine was a blip uh, on the radar screen. It, it, it was like a comet. It came and went very quickly. In her case, it, it didn't go away. I, I never want to say I know what she went through, but I have a sense, maybe better than some. Here's Bill Simmons. The Jamel thing, I, I think it seemed much more of an overreaction. It was quicker, especially the second time, where within 18 hours she was suspended for two or three weeks. That just seemed like cut and dry. Hey, you made us mad. We told you not to do this. You're, now you're going to be punished. There was no other way to look at it. I don't think she should have been suspended for that. And I tweeted last week, like, the Ringer's uh, social media policy is be a human being on Twitter. I'm not going to tell people what to do on Twitter that reflects on them, not us. And if they do something that is really reprehensible or heinous or they completely cross the line or they threaten to murder somebody on Twitter, like then you have to deal with it. But if it's somebody that works for me just ranting about Trump, as long as they don't come off like a deranged person or they don't threaten him or they don't threaten the people who disagree with them, I don't understand how you police that. They know what they did when they hired Jamal and they signed her to three different contracts or four different contracts this time. They know what they're getting. They're getting a really proud black female who grew up differently than just about anybody they had in their company. So for her to not have an opinion on Trump would have been disingenuous. I'd love to go on Twitter and drop 70 F-bombs. We'd love to do it, <laughs> okay? We'd love to. But I know that's not realistic. And so I do feel like there's a lot of compromise that can be reached without me compromising myself. Because I'm never going to do that. I'm not going to compromise myself. I'm not going to compromise my integrity. ESPN knows that. They respect that. They help to nurture that. But I also am understanding, just as a business professional and as a journalist, the position that they're in as well. It's not so much about answering to the money side of things. It's about just strictly keeping it to the journalism side of it. It's about making sure we're responsible in our, our commentary. And I think going forward, these new guidelines, from what I've heard, is that it actually is going to allow a little bit more flexibility in, in that regard, in terms of people feeling like they can voice things in a thoughtful way and that be supported and that not be frowned upon. And I think that'll be helpful because, look, there's no perfect guideline that's ever going to prepare for the moment where you know, Donald Trump goes off on an ESPN reporter. There's no social media guideline that prepares you for that. But I do think that they trust us enough in terms of our judgment regarding that platform. Back in April 2017, Linda Cohn had appeared on the Bernie and Sid show, where she responded to the notion that ESPN was losing viewers because it was becoming too political. Her response, quote, you're right. That is definitely a percentage of it. I don't know how big a percentage. But if anyone wants to ignore that fact, they're blind, end quote. In the wake of Hill's suspension, Cohen's comments came roaring back to life, and she was told to stay home and think about what she said. That was a very difficult part of my life. It was just disturbing. Not that 95% was hurting me on social media. How did that feel? That made me feel good. I mean, you're not human if you don't feel like, cause you're, because I felt like I was on an island where I had to be quiet because I was told to stay home for a day. And so it was defined as different things, but staying home for a day, you know, the people on social media saying that's suspended. And yeah, that's staying home for a day and not coming to work. I mean, how do you define that? And then, you know, to see 
listen, it's nothing to do with Jamel. I mean, I've always gone along with Jamel. I've been on her podcast. I've been on her and Michael's, all of their stuff before they hit the six and everything. And I'm big fans of both of them. But it was tough to see at first one person get support from higher ups. And then me, I had to be, I felt like I was on an island. Even, and that's why the social media support really helped me keep sane. And as it turned out and as it played out, and you look at what's been written, I was right on point. So I don't regret anything. I mean, to have to be one of these crazy moments to be in Los Angeles when I was out getting ready to do a sports center and in my hotel room and turning on the TV and seeing Sarah Huckabee Sanders mentioned my name in a press briefing, you know, when all that stuff was going on was just so surreal to me. It's like, is this really happening? I didn't ask for any of it. How do you stay true to yourself at the same time, conform to what is still a pretty gray area in this world of social media? Yeah, I mean, you're definitely walking on eggshells. And do I want to speak out on certain subjects via social media and Twitter? Of course I do. But thus the eggshells. Is there more cons than pros right now? Probably. Jim, it's tough. I mean, you know, I have to pay the bills. You know, I mean, but I have to respect my employer and my employer's rules on social media. Maybe some don't, but, you know, I will because that's part of the deal. Is it frustrating? Sure it is. But listen, I understand. I mean, I get it. I get where ESPN is coming from. They have a, a brand and a company to run. And I know right now it's probably in my best interest. Like I said, there'd be more cons than pros. I mean, my followers would love it. If I talk about, you know, why NFL ratings are in the tank, you know, first of all, the game is not good. I mean, it's just all the stars are getting hurt. People are concerned about head injuries, and, uh, yeah, there are politics involved, and people are just turned off by it. But it is different tweeting about a property or a sport that ESPN is in business with versus they're not in business. That's true. It's absolutely true. They have no ties to the NHL, so it's really easy to do. But can I talk about the NBA in that same way? No. You know, can I talk about the NFL in that same way? No. Here's Adam Schefter. I believe that people enjoy watching people from ESPN, most particular, walk on the high wire, and they're just waiting for people who work at our company to fall. I'll just say this. I know when I came to work at ESPN, and I left the NFL Network at that point in time, Seth Markman said to me, he said, well, welcome to the New York Yankees. And I said, what does that mean? He said, you'll, you'll see. And I believe that that's right, except I think, in a way, <laughs> ESPN may get more focused than the New York Yankees in this day and age. And there's certainly more resentment of it, bitterness of it, dislike of it, whatever it may be. And again, to go back to the high wire analogy, there are people in all forms of media covering all sorts of things that flat miss on things. And I know that if that happened with us, it would be paraded on social media with great joy and great frequency. It just would. My belief is that it has been a moving target ever since social media came into existence and, and we've been using it as part of our business, but also it's such a part of our personal lives and those two things can intersect sometimes in a way that isn't healthy for the company. But every time something happens that is newsworthy or where the company has to step in, certainly you take note of it and factor it in. But I'm not worried about it too much. I mean, I certainly, every time there's an update of the social media policy or any policy that ESPN has, I read it and I take note of it and I make sure that I'm cognizant of it because that's what I think you have to do that. And I don't argue with it. ESPN's Jay Billis. I work for ESPN. So if John Skipper or anyone in, in authority there, any one of my superiors tells me to do something, I do it. And I don't have any problem with that whatsoever. I do know that, and I'm sympathetic to the fact that uh, having to navigate policies for social media for so many different people in so many different areas of our coverage is an impossible task. So I'm not sitting by the phone waiting for someone to tell me what to do. I have a pretty good idea what to do, but I'm not scared of anything. And, uh, you know, at my age, you know, I made a conscious decision years and years ago that I was going to speak my mind in a respectful thoughtful, 
and hopefully educated fashion. And when I open my mouth, you know, I, I've got a reason to do it. And I'm just saying open my mouth with regard to Twitter as well. I'm not worried so much about our policies because most of the policies, every policy I've ever seen with the SBN has been based in common sense. And I'd like to think I've got a, a fair clip of common sense, probably more so, <laughs> more so than I have intelligence. Jay Rosen is a professor at NYU and has been writing about social media and journalism since 2003. And the history of Twitter is replete with innocent-seeming remarks that exploded and became something much bigger than what they were intended to be. And that's one of the things that's so dynamic and alluring about it is you never know, in a way, what could explode in that way. And I've, I've sometimes described a Twitter as like a loaded gun pointing at the head of your career because you can, with one 140-character slip, you could really be out on the street, literally, or your life could be turned upside down. You could be forever stained by what happens. So it requires a great deal of restraint and care and thought even though it looks like the opposite. It looks like the easiest thing to just sort of informally toss off a remark. And it's very deceptive, especially for somebody who has a public profile or carries the weight of the brand with them. And I think this is part of what gets people into trouble as well, corporations as well as uh, individuals. Because almost everybody underestimates Twitter. There's something about it that makes that happen. I think part of it is the funny name and that little blue bird, which seems kind of silly. And the 140 characters leads to a lot of uh, ridicule. And it seems like such a, a simple sort of artless, almost trivial thing. But what it really is, is rewiring the media system so that individuals can connect to individuals in the media in a way that goes around the bosses and around the corporate structure. And that is a very radical change. By now, you've heard many talk of the amazing shave they get from Dollar Shave Club razors, especially when used with their Dr. Carver shave butter. Now, you can add even more DSC products to your daily routine. Dollar Shave Club makes products for your hair, your face, skin, shower, everything you need. They will have you looking and feeling amazing. And it's all their own original stuff. They only use the finest premium ingredients and they deliver it to you, just like they do their razors. That means no more annoying trips to the store, cruising up and down aisles, looking at shelf upon shelf of what the hell is that and what do I do with it? You can use Dollar Shave Club for just about everything. They will have you covered head to toe. And with gift memberships and e-gift cards available, DSC can help cover the names of your holiday shopping list too. We want you to love Dollar Shave Club as much as millions do. So we've arranged for you to try your first month of their best razor, along with travel-sized versions of shave butter, body cleanser, and yes, even wipes, for just $5. After that, replacement cartridges ship for just a few bucks a month. It's the DSC starter set. Get yours for just 5 bucks, exclusively at Dollar Shave Club, dot com slash origins that's dollarshaveclub.com slash origins in october 2017 espn inked a deal with barstool sports a site that in 2014 had maligned espn reporter samantha ponder in a sexist and anti-religious screed the day before the barstool show was supposed to debut ponder surprised espn executives with a series of tweets about the 2014 blog post conjuring anger in and out of Bristol about the network's partnership with Barstool. The partnership ended after just one episode. That one was a tough one. <laughs> and a, a lot of, despite what it looked like, a lot of thought went into that and a lot of prayer, to be honest, and trying to figure out, like, how, what's the best way to do this? I still don't think I did it the best way. I mean, there are things I would change now in hindsight. But, I mean, I think that was the most, beneficial thing for me was to hear from so many women and men. And that was especially impactful to me is to hear from powerful men within our company that reached out to encourage and defend and all that, just because I think we need more male voices 
that speak up on some stuff and say like, no, hey, we're not cool with the constant objectification of women. Like, we're not. And the more men in positions of influence who speak up on that, obviously it's important for women to speak out. But the more we have advocates who are men who know us and care about us, um, I think that's really important. But, uh, yeah, that was a difficult one. And, I look, I'm grateful that in any way I was able to help women within the company feel like, all right, somebody's speaking up. Because, look, things like that, whether it's that group or another group, like, it's scary as a woman. I realize I'm, I'm almost 32 years old. I've been in this industry for 12 years. And I'm scared, you know? Like, it's scared to go against the flow, especially when you know there's going to be a mob response. Like, none of the response shocked me in the slightest. Like, I knew what was coming. I knew they were going to try and come up with anything about me. I know to this day, and probably for the rest of my career, there are people who will not stop until they feel like they've, like, in their mind and in their world and their value system ruined me. And that's okay, because I I knew that going in, and I still felt like somebody's got to say something. There was a lot of conversations behind the scenes, and whenever you have a group that, you know, is popular and comes with kind of a mob mentality, you you have to know that somebody's going to make some sacrifices in order to get that out there. And I think I'm just at a place in my life where I know I can handle that. I mean, really, my entire career up until this point, I was afraid to speak up on stuff. You know, it's not fun when thousands, if not millions of people have terrible things to say about you. Like, I don't enjoy that. I'm a human being. Like, I, it's not fun for me. There have certainly been some sleepless nights and some fears and regrets and should I have done this and should I have done that? But to your point, I think hearing from people that I really respect and, and value their opinions Hearing from them and getting their encouragement has really helped along the way. And I I think that's kind of helped me manage the fallout afterwards because I know that at least some good came from this and I was able to be a a small part of it. I'm just curious. You said there are some things you would change. What would you change? Yeah, I think the main thing I would change is I wouldn't have just named the one guy. I wish I would have just in my original tweet added the entire company. Because I think that kind of got people off of the point, you know, instead of being like, there were videos that were deleted. I mean, a lot of stuff got scrubbed from their website because it was even worse than what I originally tweeted out. The truth is, it was not, in, in my opinion, like I didn't have a vendetta against certain individuals. To me, the only reason I brought up the stuff that was about me is because I had talked to other women before and like nobody... I didn't want to drag anybody else into it, you know? You don't want to be like, here's what these people said about all these other women and, like, let them deal with the fallout. That's not fair, you know? Like, I had to be specific to what was about me in order to not kind of force that burden on other people. But my issue was not with just what was said about me. My issue was, as a whole, this is a group that celebrates the objectification of women. Not like this in the past, we apologized and moved on. This is a celebration of that. Here's Bill Simmons. Put Barstow in the title and they're completely stunned that if multiple employees upset that they had to deal with Barstow, they're blindsided by it. But, you know, the reason they wanted to do that show is because they wanted to seem younger and edgier and hipper, but they can't deal with the consequences of any of those things. So really they should just show games and and have two people talking to each other with a a screen of subjects to the right of them. (laughs) Michelle Beadle, was the Barstool thing one of those moments you were talking about, like with a predicament, like how do I handle this? Do I I weigh in? Do I step in? Do I step back? That was a tricky one, only in that, uh, look, I have had my fair share of people saying awful things over the course of the years. And much like Sam, um, I don't forget. I remember very well what people have said or may have written. So I understand where that comes in. And I think what happened, you know, I also know people who are very good friends with PFT Commenter and have described him to me in, in different ways. And so I was sort of stuck in a situation where I truly did. And this does not happen to me very often because I tend to be very black or white on a lot of it. But I actually really did see both sides. Now, don't get me wrong, the actual dude who runs Barstool, I want nothing to do with that guy, but 
this was sort of a bizarre, murky situation that they found themselves in. And I just sort of, I just let that one play out, unfortunately, because I couldn't really pick a side. And I get where Sam was coming from, and I also get where my friends were coming from. And I was curious to see how that one was going to end. Why does it seem that, apart from just being a bigger place, why does it seem that the social media equation seems more difficult than at other places? What's that old cliche, the wind blows harder at the top of the mountain? I think when you're chasing, uh, when you're smaller, uh, when you're less historically influential, you'll take any press, whether it's warranted or not, even negative press is attention. I think it's very difficult in this world of social media to be a commissioner, a president, a senator, a public figure. So I think the position they're in is simply much more difficult. I'm a member of a team. I would never want to put my bosses in the crosshairs of a controversy. I wouldn't appreciate it if they did that to me. I think we both want to help each other, elevate each other, and protect each other. Former ESPN host Colin Coward. Have I ever thought about tweeting something about politics? Yeah. And then I always say, do I really have the influence to change an election or a social cause? And could this get my bosses in trouble? And I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting to help people you work with. This is a hard business. It's a public business. This is not waste management. I think there's a certain accountability for on-air people to be responsible and to be a good teammate. And that's just how I simply see it. I don't listen to a lot of political radio, but I wouldn't turn into Rachel Maddow to hear football picks. Who's turning into me for my political acumen? My job is to deliver to my audience the product they came to consume. And Clay Travis and Jamel Hill, politically, ideologically speaking, are, are, have different views of the world. But they're responsible for their taxes, their brand, and their employment. It's of no interest to me. Uh, I don't know what uh, Jamel Hill's dreams and goals are. I mean, I have no idea. She may want to move into a different sphere, a different genre. So who am I to tell her what to say or how to say it? Do you use social media as a way to gauge some of the things that your audience is feeling or that take the temperature? Do you think it's a reliable indicator or do you even use it as one of the tools in your toolbox to understand what's going on out there? I see it as an associated press wire with vulgarity. I read a lot more than I post. I do not think it is reliable. If it was reliable, Trump would have had nine votes in the entire country. But I tell my staff all the time, Do not produce a show through Twitter. It is not the real world. It is not. I can tell you, I can judge my shows minute to minute. Kaepernick is talked about constantly on social media. When I talk about him on the air, people are over the story. So that's a story where it's much more popular in one space than it is on my TV space. Here's Dick Vitale. I never like to see the network hurt because, first of all, the network's been, I'm living in a gorgeous house. I mean, I came from a family. My parents were uneducated, fifth grade, had a doctorate of love, and we lived with a lot of love in our home but one bathroom. Well, I don't live in one bathroom anymore. I live fortunate and pretty blessed. So the network has been fantastic. When people rip the network to me, the network to me has given me a life that succeeded in any dream. So I'm going to defend it. I'm going to fight for it because there are a lot of people out there that believe in what we're doing and have that positive attitude about what we're doing. I just had a lunch with a guy today, and he kept ripping us for our political views, coming up about being liberal, this and that. See, I, I don't get into that. I, don't, I just, I said to him, I said, all I know is those four magical letters, ESPN, has given my wife and I, my family, an incredible life, and I love them for it, and I will... You know, I'll be very proud to say I'm the only one on my 39th year. I mean, I did the first game in the history of the network when I had a little trailer in 1979, uh, December 5th. I remember the day uh, very vividly in Chicago, Illinois. Heisman Trophy winner and college game days, Desmond Howard. I don't spend a lot of time on social media. I just really don't. And I think initially I was one of those individuals who if a person says something that 
was negative about me or negative about a comment that I made, and I felt the need to defend myself and spar with that person. But I've matured so, so far beyond that that I don't even pay attention that much anymore. And if I do comment, you know, it's a real slick, quick comment, and I just let it ride, and I don't go back and forth with them because I understand that's, you know, that's, that's their moment. That's what a lot of them want, so I don't give them that. But I pick and choose my battles. I always feel like, um, you know, ESPN is a big brand, so it's a big target. And so it, it goes under attack, you know, whether it's fair or not. People like to try to build their resume off of attacking a big brand, you know. And um, then you're in a position where if you come back at them, then you look like a bully. So they know there's a catch-22 in the situation. So, you know, I kind of get what was going on and what was happening in certain situations. The Jamel Hill situation, the problem is nothing can be handled internally anymore. Everything gets leaked. Everything gets out. So that's the biggest problem. So even before you dish out, the punishment is leaked. And to me, that's one of the downfalls of social media and people who want to try to build a name by using social media because they want to leak and get something first because it gives them credibility, it gives them notoriety, and it gives them relevance. On November 2nd, 2017, ESPN released to its employees new social media guidelines that included, quote, do nothing that would undercut your colleagues' work or embroil the company in unwanted controversy. Adding, we reserve the right to take actions for violations of these principles, end quote. The updated rules included a directive to seek the approval of senior editorial management before discussing and or releasing comments as opposed to facts. Here's Scott Van Pelt. It's so tricky at the moment, and I admire people that are more sort of roll down the window and stick their head out and let their hair blow in the breeze. I try to keep my commentary to what I see in sports and what I think is interesting and what's important as opposed to, you know, things that about me and my life. I don't know. I don't know if that's to my detriment or not, but obviously with, if there have been rounds of cuts that have, have happened here and across our business. And those are really difficult. Like those are really the tough ones because you, you care so much about the colleagues that you work with and who are friends and you have great sympathy for that. And like, how do you toe the line of just expressing how you feel and, and understanding that these challenges are real and our entire business is trying to figure them all out, you know? So, I mean, I had some commentary mo- mostly on the show about that, but I mean, as, as far as like getting involved politically and things of that nature, I just, I just don't do it. Once again, NYU's Jay Rosen. The tricky part of creating policies for such a medium is that it works best through people. It's Twitter's about connecting to people. And somehow you have to negotiate the fact that they are representing the brand, but they're also themselves and have to be themselves because speaking corporate speak on Twitter tends to actually tarnish the brand. So it's not one thing or the other. It's like a genuinely new hybrid form. And large organizations have trouble with that because it's hard to make rules and it's hard to enforce discipline. Here's Adrian Wojnarowski, who came to ESPN in 2017, having previously covered the NBA for Yahoo Sports. Tell me about your approach to social media now that you're at ESPN. Is it different? Almost exactly the same. I've always used, primarily used, social media to deliver news information. You know, sometimes you're linking a story that is a byline story, a news story, a column, but most times it's the initial burst of information that now, you know, we have another mechanism at ESPN where I can tweet the information and send it into our news system for our news desk internally that then starts to disseminate it beyond. So for me, that's really the primary use. I, I don't interface a lot, comment beyond the NBA, and and you probably won't even get much opinion, or it, it's really very much information news-based. Your margin for error is pretty slim in your business. Yeah, it's, it's razor thin. It's extremely competitive. There's a lot of people competing for news, a lot of people competing very well and at a high level. And being first is important. Being right's more important, but being first is important. Tell me your best social media experience and your worst. I don't know what the best would be. Adam Schefter and I have talked about this. 
I always usually just feel best about the last one and really worried about the next one. There are times where at the highest volume of deals, trade deadline, the draft, free agency, where you are balancing dozens of conversations, dozens of deals that are teams have prioritized. If we can't get this player, we're going to sign this one. If we can't get this trade, here's our B. And you're, you're trying to manage all of that because you have so many conversations over the course of a day. Uh, and even through text message, email, and I'll just transcribe them onto, into a notebook. And I just have binders of them as I go. Someday it'll be a, like for me, like personally, almost a roadmap of my reporting career, because there's a lot of, you know, they've kind of stacked up in my office. And how about the worst? I'll tell you one, um, whenever there's a player traded with a difficult name to spell, that's sometimes marginal, who you're not writing all the time, you're always at a place where you can't just search it really quickly. I just remember times of misspelling names in first reports. When I broke the James Harden trade, I remember this. I, it was a Saturday night five years ago. I remember the Notre Dame-Oklahoma football game was on. It was about 10, 15 at night, Eastern. And I remember I turned my phone. I knew that there was a conversation going on about Harden's extension. And I talked to his agent earlier in the day. I talked to the team. And they were trying to close the gap to see if they could get to a number. And I felt like if they didn't get to that number, they would trade him. I didn't think they were going to do it that day, though. And for some reason, I turned my phone over. Like, I didn't have a face. I turned because I was talking with my family, and I'm always distracted by it. I remember, so I'm just going to turn it over, so... And I, I flipped it over, and I see a text there going, James Harden's been traded to Houston. And I look, and it had been sitting on my phone for four minutes. Now, that's an eternity in my world. And I just, I was able to report it. And I, I think about those four minutes of, like, don't ever turn it over again. But I remember in my rush to, when I had the names of who was going in the trade the other way, Daquan Cook, Cole Aldridge, I spelled both their names wrong in my panic. You know, I recognize that Twitter is a mean, bitter, nasty place, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of people taking plenty of shots, and there'll be plenty of people that are saying kind and nice things. But over time, I've really tried to dismiss it all and just tried to do my job. Mort and I were working in that story all week and taking a lot of notes and talking to a lot of people, and then on Sunday morning at about 9.30, Mort had one more phone call on top of the many that he had during the week, and we came up with some last-minute facts on that story, that included Roger's contract demands. And so we wrote it up and sent it to an NFL official to give him a heads up. Hey, we're going to be reporting this. We're going to get, let you know. And the guy calls up. He's like, how come there was no heads up? We're like well, we sent that story 35, 40 minutes ago before we put it on air. And he's like, well, I, I was, he was with his child at that point in time and he missed it. Well, I, hey, listen, that's the world we live in. I'm with my child and I miss stories too. Adam, let me ask you a question. If I had the opportunity to give you a choice between operating in your capacity now versus 20 years ago before the advent of social media and huh. any kind of it, which do you think you would choose and why? It's a great question, Jim. Nobody's ever asked me that before. What I would say to you is one of the reasons I feel like I've been able to make any kind of mark in this business is because of social media. And so when 20 years ago, I'm 30 years old, and I couldn't be any hungrier to rise up the ranks. And so anytime you had a story, and I had some stories on a local level back then, there was no outlet to really get the recognition that at 30 you craved. It was simpler then. There's no question about it. It was simpler and it was probably more enjoyable. Do you check mentions of yourself or do you follow what people say about you on social media? I do, but, oh gosh, I maybe check my mentions a couple times a week, where I know I used to check it several times a day. Here's Sage Steele. No, I just, I really, it's, it's been a beautiful evolution. One of the few things I'm really proud of, of myself, especially in the past year plus, where I've just learned that, my mother told me this for all these years, I'm almost 45, I'm fine, I finally got it. Like, you can't please everybody. Not everybody's going to like you. And I used to think that I could convince people to like me because I'm a nice person and I'm friendly and I work hard, blah, blah, blah. Some of that stuff doesn't matter. They're going to like you or not like you for the right or wrong reasons. And it's been liberating to let go and, and just, I really don't care. I've got a handful of people whom I do care about and care about what they think. There were times 
several years ago when I would, you know, you kind of start to just get engaged with some people and you want to defend yourself. And I, I would get texts from Mike Tirico saying, don't do it. Put your phone down. Because he would see a response of mine and he'd be like, here she goes. <laughs> because it's easy. It's in your hand. Or a stoplight. I think it's so handy. It's just so dangerous. Sam Ponder. I will say I've struggled with that desire to know what people think about you because one, you want to be able to get better and you want honest truth and feedback. And that's something that I do feel like as a company we can get better at is giving on air people just, it doesn't have to be harsh, but just realistic feedback. Um, so I think I've kind of used social media too much to try and get some of that. Like, man, was that bad? Was that a to try and get that sort of feedback from the general public. Recently, for a, a variety of reasons, I just decided I'm, I'm not going to do that anymore. Um, it ended up being more um, negative just in my daily life and affected how I treated my family and my attitude and my mood in a way that I'm ashamed to say. Like I, it, was, it just got bad there for a little while. So, so far, I'm, I feel like I'm better off without – Seeing all that, Adam Schefter always tells me, like, just don't read your mentions at all. He says he literally never looks at a single mention, not like not Googling his name, but literally doesn't look at his Twitter mentions at all. So there might be some wisdom to that, but I'm, I'm certainly still navigating. In 1990, Steve Bornstein was named president of ESPN. He was just 38, the youngest leader in the network's history. It's got to be a nightmare, you know, to sort of eat your cake and have it too, which is what I think ESPN is trying to do, having their commentators comment, but then, you know, they want to keep it focused on sports, and that's awfully hard to do. But they got to do a, a better job of managing it because it's just not, it just takes away from the mission. So, I mean, I don't know how you walk that line of having, trying people to be personalities and be out there and get attention and not say something that reflects poorly or reflects negatively on the network. I don't know how you do that. John Skipper. What we have been slow to adapt to, and we're going to have to think through some things, is in the current polarized landscape, the attention paid to comments is very, very high and acute. And the enmity right now between various points of view is so high that these things get blown out of proportion. They also become fodder for other people's content. I find them mainly always astonished at just how vile and difficult and inappropriate such a high proportion of tweets are. It does seem to have become the home of people who seem to enjoy saying inappropriate things about people, the sort of immature exhilaration of being able to use foul language with one of the letters changed and to call people names and to threaten people. I, it, it does expose a sort of fairly astonishing, ugly underbelly of a number of uh, people out there. I've noticed, and I want to know if you agree, that, well, certainly since the new administration took place, and this is not about orthodoxy, so I'm just talking about the discourse, ESPN has become quite the target. I mean, target is an interesting word because it of course, raises the question of just how manipulative it is, just how sort of doctrinal it is, and whether there is some sort of concerted effort there. And of course, I think there is a clearly a correlation between sort of size and influence and, and ubiquity and a, a tendency then for some sort of disdain on behalf of a sort of group of people acting out. And does that alarm you? I don't know if it alarms me. It, it upsets me when I see it. Yeah. Uh, nobody likes to see it. Do you believe that ESPN is an inherently liberal institution or a place where the majority of its employees are liberal mm-hmm. and are, more importantly, manifesting that in their work? We're not inherently a liberal organization because the organization itself doesn't call for any particular orthodoxy. Uh, we're not trying to get engaged in political issues. We we make no apologies about being a progressive organization that cares about inclusion and diversity. And there are people who regard some of our those positions, which we hold to be positions that allow people to be who they are. Some people inherently regard those as 
liberal, and it's just not the way we view the world. We don't think tolerance is is a, a domain of the right or the left, or the conservative or the liberal. As to our the makeup of our population, I think that uh, we exist primarily as an executive group in New York City and Los Angeles and Bristol. Certainly in New York City and Los Angeles, the uh, there's a large proportion of the population that tends to be more liberal than the rest of the country. That's urban areas in general. We also tend to have a very, very overwhelmingly well-educated population, uh, which also tends to be somewhat more uh, liberal. So we do have to think about where we are and, and, and what that means relative to what most of the people at our company in those locations thinks. Though we are grounded in Bristol, Connecticut, I did look at the election results in Bristol, Connecticut, and the town of Bristol, Connecticut voted for Donald Trump. So there is very little doubt that we have many employees in Bristol uh, who are uh, by the nature of being in a, a smaller town, a more outlying area, a place with largely working class and roots, that it does sort of ground us. And I think it does create something I have to be mindful of, which is a little bit a broad set of beliefs with our company, which may be somewhat different in Bristol, Connecticut, than they are in New York and Los Angeles. And we're in Austin, Texas, and we're in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we're in Miami, Florida. So that's one reason we have to be respectful of people's beliefs. And why I'm not sure that I believe that there is a sort of predominant orthodoxy at the company, either institutionally or, or relative to our population. I mean, you have a variety of burners on your stove at any given time that are erupting with rights fees and upcoming negotiations and discussions with conferences and managing all these employees and various things. But it seems that this is one of the more challenging aspects of a job, do you think? Uh, I do think. And by the way, I, I actually, I think I have like the largest industrial stove in the media management business. I, Without a doubt. Like 83 burners or something. Yeah, this is one of the ones where the temperature goes from off to double high immediately. Sam Ponder. So I don't know how you navigate this. I do not envy the people at ESPN who are trying to manage all this. Um, because in some ways, and I, I told one of our executives this, it feels impossible to set exact objective standards for everybody, for every situation, especially in this day and age where politics and sports are so intertwined, to know what you can say and what you can't say. The short truth for me is that it just makes me tweet less. And I'm sure the company is happy with that. Let's give the final question about the crazy world of social media at ESPN to its president, John Skipper. My question to you is, is this even a manageable environment? Um... We think so. It was 1941, and the magician who had hoodwinked the nation with a fake news report on radio, all about a Martian invasion of New Jersey, began his first feature film, Citizen Kane, with a fake newsreel, News on the March. It was the Orson Welles version of Time Marches On, which were produced for movie theaters by a giant media megaforce, and offering journalism as phony as a glass eye, as Damon Runyon used to say. Today, news is no longer on the march. Now, thanks to the web and our own information centers set up via social media, it's constantly rushing out of the woodwork, so to speak. With change so constant and pervasive, it would be silly for ESPN not to be as fluid as possible in its attempts to manage social media. But we can easily forgive Disney shareholders and ESPN management from hoping that those attempts have a better track record in the next decade than they did in the previous 10 years. This is Jim Miller for Origins.